Earth. Gotta copy Earth. Welcome to For the Quantum Grammar Shoot podcast. The only podcast of its kind on the interwebs, as far as I know. This is the 101st episode, I think, if I can count correctly. And what we're going to talk about in this episode is limitation. Now, when we take it in the context of quantum grammar, in correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax grammar, that takes the form of one and one is one. Rule one, rule equal. Closure. In the fiction, in what we call adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, plain English fiction babble, you will find dictionaries with multiple meanings for each word. And they call these things definitions. Yes, I'm aware that there is a linguistic faction out there who likes to take the phonetic sound of a word and correlate it with another word. For example, when you hear the word definition, you might hear the word two words, def, Phoenician, as in a Phoenician, someone from Phoenicia. I don't get into those types of things too much. I mean, it doesn't have any practical weight or value to anything that I do in the now space continuum. So I'm not. I, that's why I don't. You ever, don't ever hear me touch on those things because those things are so open to opinion and assumption presumption I just stay away from it so we're going to concentrate on the the word definition right now D-E and then finite and then I-O-N so we know what finite means right it's a limit D-E means no and then I-O-N means contract so a definition is a no finite contract that's why there are multiple meanings for each word because there's no closure there's no finite there's no limit to the contract. If you write a contract and you use a word that has 20 different meanings, well, which meaning are you talking about? Did you give closure to that? Because now it can be open to assumption presumption. And these are the quote unquote word games that the fiction plays. Correct sentence structure is something else entirely. There is a limitation to it. There's a limitation to the contract. Each word is a vessel, and each vessel contains meaning, a finite meaning. There's a limit to it. Think of it like a cup that you can only put a finite amount of water in it or it's going to overflow. So you top it off and that's it. That's your cup and that's your value of water in the cup. It's the same thing with words and that's closure that's limitation you have to know your limitations with your terms and conditions you have to have closure on those things when you write a correct sentence structure communication parse syntax grammar contract and that in a nutshell is you know very briefly how limitations apply to the grammar Of course, the limitation applies to all other areas of one's life. Uh, It's always good to know your limitations. Physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally. To know when you've reached that limit. People like to say that they push their limitations. That you can push a limitation. But a limit is a limit. There's a beginning and a middle and an end. If you thought you reached the end and it's not the end and you keep going, well, then you haven't reached that limitation yet. But there is a limit. Trust me. There is a limit and you will find it. Whether you know it or whether you stumble on it, you will find it. 
Now, there is a dichotomy or an anomaly with this concept of limitation when it comes to what we'll call the now space and what I like to call the continuum. Because now, the word now is a non-tangible condition of state. So I don't use that in my contracts. However, I do use it uh, in teaching because most people are familiar with the term now space and they know what that means. So I use it for educational purposes, for knowledge cultivation purposes, but in my correct sentence structure contracts, I don't use it. I use the word continuum. I don't know if or where the continuum began or started. And I don't know if or where the continuum ends. I just know that it continues. So there really isn't a limitation on that particular domain, the domain of the continuum. I know that there's a limitation to my existence within that. I know that. There's a limitation to everything pretty much that's within that continuum. But the continuum itself, I mean, logically you would think, well, yeah, if everything else has a limit, then the continuum would have a limit. A limit. However, you're going to have a hard time proving that to anybody, anywhere, any place, any time. You're just not going to be able to do it because it continues. It's here and it's gone. It's here and it's gone. As I'm speaking, I'm navigating through the now space continuum. These moments are gone. And what we have left are memories. We navigate exclusively off of memories. I mean, you can say, well, you know, live in the moment. And you can do that limit the moment. But really what you're doing is you're living in your memory of the moment. If you really, really think about it. You're living in the, your memory and your interpretation of the moment. You're never really in the moment because the moment's gone. The minute you think about it, the second, the nanosecond that you think about it, it's already gone. Bye-bye. It's in the rearview mirror. So that's sort of a conundrum, if you think about it, when it comes down to this topic. And so that's what's so interesting about correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. What's so interesting to me is that it claims the continuum. It, cl it claims the now space domain. Whereas in the fiction, you're either talking about the future or the past. Now, as I just said, everything that you're navigating through is a memory of something. If you write a correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar claim, in the now space jurisdiction, you're still working off a of memory. You're not really in the now space, like literally. But then again, you are if you think about it. Now, see, that's the dichotomy that I was mentioning earlier. I'm trying to talk my way through this because I've never really talked through this to another individual. So we're, you and I are on foreign soil right now. We're, we're in the unknown right now navigating so can you be in the now space and yet not be in the now space because the minute you say you're in the now space you're not in it anymore but yes you are like right now I'm speaking to you every single moment I'm in the now space but it's gone and it's gone and it's gone so that's the interesting and very curious thing about the condition and state of the domain of the now space continuum and as it relates to correct sentence structure, those contracts exist in the now through perpetuity. Whereas an adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, plain English fiction babble contract is a past tense contract or a future tense contract. It's never really taking place right now. I don't think they even try to claim that in any contract that I've seen. They're always 
juxtaposing past tense with future tense a lot of times in the same sentences. So as others have said before me, that's when it comes down to the volition, the volition of the thinking. What is the volition behind using both future and past tense in a sentence? Of course, I can't make an assumption about what someone else's volition is. Well, I mean, I can make an assumption, but I'm not going to. In a correct sentence structure contract, I'm not going to tell you what you're doing or what your volition is. Because I don't really know that for sure. The only thing I can do is claim a damage that maybe you've damaged me or that I've witnessed you do something. I can claim that. But I cannot make a claim for you or your volition. Only you can do that. That is the limitation, another limitation, on the correct sentence structure contract. Is one may only make a claim for oneself. Unless, of course, someone else gives you uh, permission or consent to make a claim for them. Then you can make a claim for them. But for the most part, we may only make claims for ourselves. Anything else is an assumption, presumption, and, more importantly, a trespass. If you think about how we navigate through everyday life using limitation, then you will see some correlations between analogies that I'm about to use. For example, a gas tank on a motor vehicle. The gas tank is the vessel and the gasoline, the petrol, is the value or whatever, the the cargo that gets put into the tank. And that's carried by a greater vessel, which is the motor vehicle that the engine uses the gasoline as fuel. And then the tank, as time goes on, the more you use the vehicle, the less gas you have until it's empty. You can kind of think of that, as, you know, your own vessel body construct in the same sense as that when you eat or when you rest, you are replenishing your gasoline, your fuel. Some days your tank is topped off. Other days, it may be only three-quarter full because you didn't get enough sleep. Perhaps you didn't get the correct things to eat. So on and so forth. So your limitation will vary from day to day as far as, you know, energetically, what you can, how much you can perform, what you can produce, how productive you are, your condition of state of your, of your psyche, whether you're in a good mood or whether you're in a gloomy mood whether you're happy, depressed, sad, whatever it is, all these things figure into your um, your gasoline tank in your vessel construct, your body construct. Those limits vary from day to day, but they are there, and it's always good to be aware of them. Now this brought, I'm trying to tie this into something uh, that just happened to me here, a little bit ago. Well, not something that happened to me, but something I experienced. I just took a very long drive through some back roads in the country in Michigan. It's like endless fields, uh, country houses, very little traffic, children riding bicycles, waving as I go by. You know, people outside working on their cars or farming, you know, tractors going down the highway, pissing everybody off (laughs) because they're going so slow. Um, You know, just all the, you know, country living, which reminded me of my childhood because I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania and I spent much of my childhood alone. I had no siblings that were regular uh, tenants at the house I, I lived at. It was just me. And so I had the farm and I had miles and miles of wilderness 
of the quote-unquote big woods to just wander around and do whatever I wanted to do. And I also had books. My nearest neighbor was a couple miles away. I did have a bicycle. So I either walked everywhere or I rode my bike everywhere. Now, if I decided to go play with some of my neighbors as a child, I would ride my bike and we'd go play. And sometimes, sometimes there would be disagreements. Sometimes there would be fistfights, violent confrontations with no adults around. This is how it was growing up in the country. You pretty much had to fend for yourself. And so I learned that at a very early age. Well, I also learned that I had an aptitude for uh, physical confrontation. But that's neither here nor there. But again, it's just part of the whole thing of learning um, your limitations. What you're good at, what you're not good at. What you need to work on, what you don't need to work on. In any case, when we'd have a disagreement as children, usually it ended up being a fist fight about it. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The next day, usually the very next day, if not later on that same day, whoever it was that you got into a confrontation with and you got into a fist fight with, you were friends again. You were friends again and it was forgotten. Whatever it was, the tension that built, the energy that built, bam, 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 it was released, and now it's gone. There was no hate. There was no resentment. That's how things were solved. And then as you grew older, you know, and as I paid more attention to the way the adults acted in my vicinity, it was sort of almost the same way, only they didn't get into a physical fistfights. Unless maybe they were drinking alcohol, then it might happen. But they would argue and yell it out and then move on. There were really no grudges held to speak of. Everybody knew their limitations. I think, and this is an opinion because this is a podcast of opinion, I think that with the advent of the internet and social media that people don't these days, this gen, these generations people don't know their limitations they don't have a clue what their limitation is and it's where you come into people talking about twitter fingers or keyboard warriors people that talk a whole lot of mess behind a computer screen when there is no way in hell they would ever talk like that to another individual face to face because if they would they wouldn't be walking out of there with an unbroken face (laughs) they wouldn't be walking out of there with unmarked unscathed let's put it that way I think that the advent of the internet number one has caused people to forget or not care about their limitations, not know their limitations. And number two, it has eroded the attention span of people. I mean, you have Twitter, which limits the characters you can use in a message, in a post. You have things like TikTok or Instagram stories or Snapchat where you have a limited amount of time that you can make a video, like minute long videos or you know, 30 second long videos, three minute long videos. Most people, when they get on YouTube, if they see there's a video that's longer than two or three minutes, they don't want to watch it. They have no attention span. <laughs> and they don't know it. Which is the the funny part about it. The humorous part is the the limitation that they set on themselves in that respect. Wow, if it's longer than five minutes, I don't have time to watch it. Isn't there some way you can sum it up? It's like, it's almost like everyone's now space has become 
greatly decreased. Like the availability of now space has been greatly limited. To use the term that we're, we're talking about, limitation. But to get back to the uh, topic that I touched on a couple minutes ago, the people on the internet don't care about boundaries or limitations. They just think that they can just come in and say whatever they want to say to whomever they want to say it with no fear of consequences. Sort of reminds me of what uh, one of my favorite I guess you could say heroic fantasy authors Robert E. Howard used to say that it's a paraphrase civilized man is is more rude and lacks more lacks etiquette than a basic barbarian because a civilized man doesn't think that someone will call them to the carpet on what they're saying meaning barbarians know people out in the wild or in the country as i mentioned earlier you know, know that there are consequences if they say something. They know there are going to be consequences and they've already weighed it in their mind whether they're prepared to deal with it or not. Civilized people are not the same way. There are people out there right now, and some of them are my friends, who actually think that you can say whatever you want and no physical consequence will come of it that you can just walk around insulting whomever you want to insult, saying the meanest, nastiest, dirtiest, most horrific things to someone, and there should be no consequences for it. And if there are consequences for it, then the person bringing the consequences is in the wrong, not the person who's talking the shit, so to speak. It's very interesting uh, because that's not how it used to be. And growing up on a farm and having experienced the type of environment where you have to be accountable for your words, you if you slip up, and if, say for example, if you're having a football game like we used to have as kids, oh, kids. I was trying to get through a whole damn uh, video without saying the word that word, but there I just said it. It slipped out. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen. As a child, as children, I used to play football sometimes with my cousins, sometimes with my friends, where I, you know, grew up in the general like five mile area. When I, if I would ride my bike an hour to go play football with some friends. You can bet your butt I was serious about it. And it would turn into a serious game. And there were children of all ages there. Not only me, you know, who maybe I was, for example, 9 or 10 years old. There might be, you know, children that are 14 or 15 years old. Size discrepancies, disparities. And maybe, you know, if someone... As I'm running the ball, someone grabbed my shirt and ripped my shirt. And I turn and call them a name. Well, I might get socked in the mouth for doing that. But I knew that. Because I knew the limitations of what I'm doing. On the internet, people that are on the internet don't think that way anymore. They think they can say whatever they want and get away with it. And... Unfortunately, it seems to be getting, you know, seems to be spilling over into the quote unquote real world, which we can see the manifestation of that in uh, road rage incidents, people drawing out pistols and shooting at people simply because they cut them off in traffic or they pulled out in front of them or didn't use their turn signal. You have not used your turn signal, so therefore you need to die in front of your children. I mean, what kind of society has this turned into? It's insanity. But it's the world we live in. 
at this moment. And this drive out to the country that I was sharing with you has really brought that home to me. Whereas when you're in a populated area, that's where you experience the insanity. And when you go out into the country, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit slower paced. I mean, growing up, I didn't have access to any electronics. I had no television growing up. Um, Only later on, when I was probably hmm, maybe 12 or 13 years old, uh, my house got television and we had two channels. We had the public uh, PBS station and we had, like I think, ABC Channel 10 or something like that. And that was all fuzzy because we had to use the rabbit ears. We didn't get cable till so way later on in my teenage years so I was brought up way different than this generation that's out here right now on these internet streets it's a completely different domain for sure to bring it back home to the original topic of limitations I'm going to apply it to my YouTube channel. There are limitations on my YouTube channel. Limitations to what I can do and what you can do. The terms and conditions are the limitations. The limiting factors. I don't permit conspiracy theories or opinions to be published in the comments section of my YouTube channel. I try for the most part to keep it fixed on the grammar topic. I don't really, you know, for the terms and conditions of the channel, I would highly recommend you, if you're going to decide to comment, not to tell other people what they should or shouldn't do. I would highly recommend that you don't share your personal belief systems or spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs or anything like that. It's pretty simple. Just keep it focused on the grammar. Now, there are some comments that come in on the gray areas that I know, perhaps, you know, giving the people the benefit of the doubt that they don't know any better. They're new. And these terms and conditions specifically and directly have to do with trolls that I deal with. Because I do deal with trolls. And there are some very clever trolls. Some of the members on my YouTube channel could quite possibly be trolls. They could quite possibly be interlopers. Just very clever. In it for the long haul. Now, do I think that me, as an individual, claiming what I claim to be a grammar tutor and all that stuff, do I think that I'm important enough to merit someone who would buy a membership just to come on to troll me? No, I don't think that. I don't think that at all. What I do think is that there are some very interesting people out there with some very interesting motivations, and... Not everyone has a, let's put it this way, a benevolent volition. Some people are malicious. Some people do have missions to disrupt or create chaos in an otherwise peaceful and calm construct such as the one that I cultivate on my YouTube channel by enforcing those terms and conditions of sticking to the grammar and there are people who <laughs> who get upset when I come on and I say there are plenty of other places for you to tell other people how they should live how you think they should live their lives what they should or shouldn't do There are plenty of other places for you to go to share your religious beliefs or your spiritual beliefs and to promulgate your ideology. This is not one of them. This is a place 
for learning correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. And then when I do that, then people get all upset and say that, you know, they'll, they'll say all kinds of different things. They'll say, oh, you're, you're Jason, you're making an assumption that that's what I'm doing. And, uh, uh, no, that's not what I'm doing at all. What I'm doing is exercising judge mechanics and enforcing the terms and conditions of the vessel that you chose to comment on. No one coerced you or twisted your arm to type your comment into my comments field and disregard the terms and conditions. No one forced you to do it. You did it of your own volition, your own choice. Well, I mean, of course, there's a chance that someone may have held a gun to your head and said, hey, you need to comment on Jason's comment field and totally disregard his terms and conditions. But I highly doubt that happened. So knowing that, you made the choice to veer off the, t- off the path. You made the choice to violate the terms and conditions. And now I come on and serve you notice that that is what you've done. And then you get upset about it. Because you feel that you should do whatever it is that you want to do. Which, for the most part, a lot of people nowadays on the internet, that's how they feel. That they they can do whatever they want to do. As I uh, shared with you earlier in the podcast about limitations, people don't, don't think of limitations like that. They don't even have basic etiquette. They just think they can go on to any old place and just say whatever they want. Freedom of speech. (laughs) Well, that tells me that for better or for worse, they did not have the same upbringing that I did where there are consequences for what you say and there are consequences if you violate the terms and conditions of the vessel that you chose to be a guest on. Because remember, ladies and gentlemen, you are guests aboard my YouTube vessel. And you're more than welcome to come aboard. I just ask that you honor my terms and conditions. If you, if you, ladies and gentlemen, have your own vessel, your own YouTube vessel or whatever it is, and I want to come on board... I will most certainly honor your terms and conditions. I will definitely not have any volition or intent to impose my terms and conditions on you because why would I do that? That makes absolutely no sense. As I've said in the past, that's that's akin to going to someone's house and just basically busting down the door and saying, you know what? I, I know this is your house. This is where your family lives, you and your children and whatnot. But guess what? I'm coming in here and I'm going to have a naked college party with about 200 people here. We're going to be drinking alcohol. We're going to be defecating on your on your walls and on your floors and so on and so forth. We're just going to do whatever we want in your house because we don't care about your terms and conditions. It's all about our terms and conditions. Well, where I come from, that's not how it works, ladies and gentlemen. As Bruce Lee once said, use limitation as, use no limitation as limitation. I get a chuckle whenever I hear that saying because when you really think about it logically, it makes absolutely no sense. Although I do understand the volition behind saying that, it's it's a positive performance thing where, you know, don't don't limit yourself to this, that, or the third, that that you can go further than that. But then, you know, logic rears its head, and you realize, yes, there are limits. They may not be where, exactly where you once thought they were, but they are still there nonetheless. You may be able to push them or push what you originally thought they were to where they really are. 
but they're there. And that's needed. It's necessary in navigating the now space continuum in everyday life. Because if, you, if you're sure of those boundaries, of those limitations, then you know what you have to work with and you can pretty much go into any situation knowing yourself, knowing your tools, knowing your skills, and come out safely on the other side of any situation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little bit longer podcast. If you're interested in learning correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, you can contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and apply for a workshop. Um, If you have any questions, pop them in the comments field. If I have a chance, I will answer them. And other than that, this wraps up this edition of For the Quantum Grammar Shoot. Thanks for joining me, and I'll catch you next time.